Good evening. Welcome to the Toolbox. Again, we're in week 11 already of this um, series called The Story of Scripture, Understanding the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I just want to give you guys props for those of you that have stuck with us. I know it's a long series, but um, again, I believe that if you stick with this, you'll just see Scripture in a totally different way. Understand the story from the very beginning to the very end and how it all comes down to, to one person, um, our King Jesus Christ. So um, I'm trusting that you're growing, that you're learning a lot. Obviously, as we go through the 66 books, um, you know, from the beginning to the end, we're skipping over a lot. We're just touching on highlights, and we'll be continuing that um, this evening as well. So just want to remind us, um, the Old Testament, if we summarize up the Old Testament with our 512, 5512, we have gone through the Pentateuch, and we've seen how sin is a problem and, and how God started to deal with that, and he made some promises, and we talked about covenants, we talked about um, the, the Abrahamic covenant. We've talked about the Mosaic covenant. We've talked about the Davidic covenant. We talked about the new covenant that the prophets referenced and we're getting into now with the New Testament. But um, we saw how God set up a sacrificial system that showed um, his holiness and per, his perfection and how where there is sin is there is death and all kinds of ideas that we went through in the Pentateuch as we, as we um, really watched um, God deal with his people and, and portray himself to the world through the, the lineage of, of Abraham and how uh, he made, again, as I referenced, the covenant with him in, in, in Genesis chapter 12. Um, so there were several key points and key chapters that we saw in the, the Pentateuch. Then we moved on to the history section where there were 12 books. And again, we continued to watch um, how God was moving through his chosen people, the nation of Israel. And, and um, then we, we also saw how God wanted us to deal with him um, in the books of poetry, in the five, the five books of poetry, how we are to worship him, how we are to treat one another in wisdom. Then we moved on um, and just quickly went through um, really the prophets, um, the major prophets, the five major prophets and the 12 minor prophets and how they had a message. And their main message was to repent for the people to turn their hearts back towards God, to remember that the covenant, the Mosaic covenant that they had made with their God, that they would follow him, that they would obey his laws and his commandments. And, 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 and again, the message of the prophets, main message was to repent. But yet at the same time, they also had a message of hope and, and of a coming king, of a, of a covenant, a servant king. And, and they were kind of veiled and hidden and references in these. And they really wouldn't make sense until we got to the New Testament, which we started on last week. So again, the structure of the old, 512, 5512. We had the Pentateuch, history, poetry, Major prophets, minor prophets. Then we move on to the New Testament, 4 1 21 1. And last week we talked about the Gospels, um, where the King has come onto the scene. Jesus will, will show how all of these promises that God had made would be fulfilled, and, and, and God never goes back on his word, and he had a plan from the very beginning. So we saw that there are four different accounts, four different authors, for four different reasons. They highlighted different aspects of Jesus' ministry, but basically we had um, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus presented as the king. In the Gospel of Mark, he was a servant. So um, kind of a funny thing, we had the king who came to serve, which is a paradox and which is an upside down um, way of seeing things, the, the correct way in the kingdom of God, but upside down to the world. Then we saw the gospel of Luke, how Jesus was presented as, as a man, the perfect man, like one of us, and, and, um, but yet different. And then we also saw in the gospel of John how, how Jesus was actually God in the flesh. The, the word became flesh and, and dwelt among man. So we saw again in these four gospels, the king who came to serve, and we also say, saw Jesus as God who who became a man. So, um, so that was what we went through last week. And now we move on to the, to the one portion. So again, we've got 4, 1, 21, 1. We have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And tonight we're going to talk about the book of Acts. Um, then we're going to move in next week to the uh, letters, the 21 books uh, of letters. And we will talk about how we are to, to live out what we believe and, and how those letters relate to that. And then in the last week, we'll, we'll round it all up with the book of Revelation, which is prophecy and kind of brings things together. And, and, um, and hopefully in all this, we are seeing how the story unfolds. Um, and so again, today, tonight, we're in history. And I've got a couple of objectives, as we always do. But one is we want to see how this new covenant 
is coming to pass, how, how God is working. And again, in a way that, that, that people would not have expected. Um, and we will see how it all starts to make sense. And, and God fulfilled his word, fulfilled his promises, his covenants in a way that, that just um, only God could dream up, only God could work out. So we'll see how the new covenant's coming to pass. And, and then in this book of Acts, the history section of the New Testament, we're going to just I- identify a few key chapters and run through those pretty quick because there's so much um, in, the, in, in the, you know, the, the several chapters of Acts that we could go through and great stories. But basically the book of Acts um, is, is how the church started, the history of the church. And so we're talking about theological history here. Just like we had theological history in the Old Testament, the 12 books of, of history in the Old Testament, and the five books of the Pentateuch, um, we have this theological history in the New Testament. But the history is different than just um, like a history book where it's just presenting the facts of history. It's more than that. The author is writing what he's writing with a specific reason in mind. And again, our belief in all of Scripture is that God is the one who inspired the writing of Scripture. In other words, His Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, directed these writers. There were over 40 different authors that wrote the 66 books over a 14 or 1500 year time span. But amazingly, as we're seeing, there's a common thread, there's a theme. We're seeing the story played out uh, uh, in these different ages and different time periods, how God is faithful to his word. So um, so the author, in this case, it's Luke, um, is writing in, in a way and in, in listing things for a purpose and is continuing us on in this journey as he, was, as, as, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the way that he wrote and what he put down. So, um, so really, the book of Acts is Luke, the Gospel of Luke, part two. So I want us to go back to, to Luke. I've got it on your, on your sheets, your notes. You can follow along. But also, if you've got a Bible, and I haven't mentioned this very often, but it would be great if you'd just follow along in the Bible, most of the passages that I'm reading from are from the New International Version. So I just want to take us back to Luke chapter 1 to kind of set, to see how all these different sections, you know, the 512, 5512, 41, 21, 1, how they all work together and they build upon each other. So Luke chapter 1, the beginning of, of the Gospel of Luke. And again, Luke was a Gentile. He was showing us that Jesus was actually a man. Um, he was like an investigative reporter, and we'll see here in Luke 1. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from whom the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So in other words, Luke was writing down this account of the life of Jesus Um, for a friend of his, Theophilus. And Theophilus was most likely a Roman official. Um, He was probably, we probably believe that he was a God-fearer that we talked about last week. So they weren't Jews. They didn't take on all the customs of the Jewish faith, um, but they started to believe that there was one true God. And um, and so they started to believe in him. And and, um, so he he was a God-fearer who would most likely come to know who Jesus Christ was. Um, there's some reason for us to believe that he was, a, you know, was likely in support of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, which we will talk much more about next week. Um, but there's a connection um, from, from the Gospel of Luke where, where, where Luke himself went out and investigated all the reports of Jesus and wrote those down in an orderly account so that people would understand who Jesus was. There's a connection then to Acts. So Acts is really um, the sequel to, to the Gospel of Luke. Acts is, is part two of Luke. So we're going to move on to Acts, verses 1 through 11. And really what we're at now in the history, the king has come. Um, and we understand, as we saw in the Gospels, Jesus is the king, and, and he came onto the scene. But we also saw that he was crucified, that he rose from the grave, and then he ascended back into heaven. So the king has come, but the king is leaving. But we can also be assured that the king is coming back. So that's where we're at in the story. Jesus came. He has ascended back into heaven, so the king has left, and we are now in the time period where we are waiting for him to come back. But in the meantime, um, some great things took place, and that's really um, the gospel, the, the, really the book of Acts, the history of the early church. And we are actually in the same time frame. We are to do the work of the church and waiting for the king to come back. So Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is Luke writing. He says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day that he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, 
after his suffering. So again, we understand from the gospel that he wrote as he wrote about the life and the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so it says after his suffering. So he is referring, Luke is referring back to the crucifixion, back to Jesus willingly dying on the cross for the sins of mankind, which goes all the way back to Leviticus because remember this story continues on. So it says after his suffering, he presented himself to them. So in other words, after Jesus was crucified, um, Luke is writing that, that he rose from the dead. So we know that Jesus was crucified, he rose from the grave, he presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs. And we know some of these proofs, he, he spoke, uh, he, he came and, and he was back in the flesh, and, and we're told that he walked among people, that he visited people, that he ate, um, that he appeared to people. He told Thomas, look at the wounds in my side, you know, go ahead and touch them. So, so he gave many convincing proofs. In other words, he came back to life and he mingled with people. All right, so I want to I want to stop right there, and I want to move over to First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Um, and again, I, I'm sure we'll get into more of this next week. But the bedrock, the foundation of of the Christian faith is the resurrection, because see, none of this would would really matter if if the one that we worship, the one we serve, was not. God in the flesh, if he was not the one who was able to conquer sin and death, if he was not the one who was not able to do what he had said, because see, Jesus came and, and claimed to be God in the flesh, and he said that he would lay his life down and then would take it back up again, that he would rise again. So if Jesus had not risen from the dead, we're told in different places in scripture from the apostle Paul that our faith would be futile, that, that, that all that we be, would believe would just fall apart. And, and we're gonna see how Jesus being alive is so key and crucial to, to everything that we're doing as it, as, it, as it relates to these covenants and, and things that we've seen from the Old Testament on. So I wanna read 1 Corinthians 15, a, a portion of it. And, and I would encourage you to maybe come back and read this on your own because again, it is foundational to the, the faith of us Christians. But it says this, speaking of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, brothers and sisters, I wanna remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. Otherwise it, it, none of this matters. None of it makes sense. Jesus was just another man, maybe a good teacher, but, but not unlike any others that had come before him. But this is the key. This is the Christian faith right here in a nutshell. Verse 3, it says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, this is what Paul had come to believe and had learned from, from those who had gone before him, who had come to believe in Jesus and maybe had, had even seen him rise from the dead and in the flesh. But it says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is key, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He fulfilled the, the, the law and the prophets, the Levitical um, system that we read about. It says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And again, Paul emphasizes according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. What scriptures is Paul talking about? We've seen it. It's the 512, 5512. It's the law and the prophets. It's, it's the ones that, that actually they were writing, whether they knew it or not, God in his ordained wisdom was letting these people write about a time that was coming about the king of kings jesus christ and it was recorded in the old testament scriptures and again those were hidden they were veiled they wouldn't have made much sense until we get the the new testament story so oftentimes i've heard the old testament is the the new testament concealed and the new testament is the old testament revealed and and paul's kind of saying that here that this crucifixion that the resurrection was written about was was talked about in the old testament it says christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to cephas and who was peter and then to the twelve after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So in other words, um, what we're seeing here is that, that Jesus rose from the grave, and that became, that is what changed everything. That's the foundation of our faith. So um, as we get back into Acts chapter 1 now, this one event Jesus rising from the dead. Because if we were in the Gospels, we saw when Jesus was crucified, his followers scattered. They were, they were downcast. They, they thought that their king had, had, was just like others and that this movement that they had been a part of was coming to nothing. They scattered. They were afraid. 
They were scared. Once they understood and saw that Jesus had risen from the grave, it changed everything. So we're going to move back um, to Acts. And so it says, um, through the Holy Spirit, after the suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. So again, after Jesus had, had risen from the dead, there was a time period of about 40 days where he continued to, and from implication here, it, it doesn't seem as if those 40 days he was with the, the followers and the apostles um, for the whole time. It's, it's almost as if he moved in and out among them. So the implication that he's not always with them. And, and again, in all of this, I, I hope we're seeing and we're getting more and more comfortable um, with the mystery of Scripture. There are some things that we just don't know. There are some things that, that right now are, are kind of veiled and, and even hidden to us. And even as we look back, there, there are some details and things that we don't understand. What did Jesus look like? Why did some people recognize him? Why did some not? What's the resurrection body that we're going to, to receive um, based upon who Jesus was, what he did, and the body that he had? You know? And we know from Scripture that the body that Jesus had was no longer perishable. And he's the first fruits, and we will have one like that. But, but again, I've taught on heaven and, and the resurrection and things. And, and there are just a lot of things that are mysterious that we don't quite understand, we don't quite grasp. And, and I don't think we will until Jesus comes back. But it's okay. It's okay because there's a whole lot that we do understand. And as we're seeing, again, in the story, hopefully your faith is building because you see how God works. And he's patient and it takes time, but, but he fulfills his word and his promises. So it says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, verse 3, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. That was his message we talked about last week. The kingdom is now at hand, and, and Jesus is the king. He's on the scene. On one occasion, it says, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised. So the gift that, that Luke's gospel had, had referenced, if we went back and read that, that, that Luke talked about, the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were to wait. Jesus says, we want you, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. And, and I will again, after these 40 days, for the, you know, go back and again ascend to the Father. And, and, um, and I want you to wait for that, that promise, um, the seal that, that, that starts to put this all together. So it says, wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is, is different from the baptism that, that John had spoken about. John came as a prophet that we saw about, that we saw it, like Elijah from the Old Testament, who came and his message was, repent, turn around, come to God. And people were baptized, and, and it was a baptism of repentance. They were to wash themselves and to say, hey, no longer am I heading in my own direction, but I'm going to turn around and follow God. But this is different. This is a saturation, which the word baptism means to immerse, a saturation in the Holy Spirit that would be sent um, when Jesus Christ um, ascends back to the Father. So uh, it says in verse 6 now, Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now again, we have the advantage of seeing the whole picture. And, and I know if you're like me, sometimes you will read through the scriptures and because we, we have a bias and because we have, again, we see it, how it is all unfolded, which, which they were just in the midst of. Um, sometimes you can look back and think, were these, were these men and women just kind of knuckleheads? I mean, were they missing this? Hadn't Jesus told them that he was going to rise from the dead? Didn't they have the scriptures? Didn't they have the prophets? I mean, how did they miss some of the things that they missed? Because I, I find it funny that, that now in this point, see, they, they don't ask about, hey, what's this Holy Spirit thing that you're talking about? They don't ask what's the difference between John's baptism and the Holy Spirit baptism. They, they don't ask about, you know, the, these different things. And they, instead they say, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And again, do you remember we talked about, I, I believe it was last week, maybe a couple weeks ago, but um, they were anticipating the king, and we understood that from 2 Samuel chapter 7, and, and, and they also understood that God had promised them to be a worldwide blessing and to be a people with a land. So, so they were confused, and they were at a genuine concern, and that might have been the first question that I would have asked as well, even though we understand that in a different way now. But um, they, were, they were basically saying, hey, is this the time now where you will be fulfilling specifically what the prophets, what, what the covenants had told us would happen? 
But as we talked about again, I believe last week, we, in, in weeks previous, we see that lap one, Jesus' first time around, was about being a suffering servant, that he, the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves, that he would save us from our sins. And, and that's, that's what his first go around was all about. And the second lap will be the time of peace where the, the righteous king will rule forever and, and, and he will be in our midst. But at this point in our story, Rome's still in power. You know, Rome's, Rome, Rome still is controlling things. There's no king in the line of King David. And, and now they had seen Jesus in his teachings and they had seen him rise from the dead. And, and they're saying, okay, finally now, Jesus, is this the time? Is this the time where all your promises, the, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, would, would all these be fulfilled? Is this the new time, the new covenant coming um, to fruition here? And so, so I think it's a practical question, and it's a question that, that, that I think makes sense. And, and also, you know, they, they were, I mean, think of the high that they had to be on. Jesus had done miracles. He had taught like no other. I mean, he'd walked on water. We could go through that list of just, incredible things and then again their hopes kind of were dashed and 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 shattered when jesus was crucified but then just three days later he rises from the dead and and appears among them and they're thinking yes we are back on the winning team back in it was uh i went to three super bowls in a row back in 1996 1997 and 1998 we had a company and and we were kind of wined and dined by nfl properties and Tom and Kathy and myself and Christy were able to go to these Super Bowls. And, and I remember as, as we went to these, they had, we, we were actually from our hotel to the Super Bowl venue, which we went to one in, in New Orleans, we went to one in San Diego, we went to one in Phoenix. And, and they would take us by police escort, um, this, these group of retailers and, and other uh, you know, guests of NFL properties, and, and they would transport us by caravan, police escort, um, to the Super Bowl venue, and there were parties that we were able to get into, and, and, um, and, and we were just kind of treated like bigwigs during these, this Super Bowl time. And, and you know, it's real easy um, when you're kind of in power to get used to that and to think, wow, I, I am somebody. And so you could imagine, just from the human side, these, these apostles, these followers of Jesus to say, hey, wow, this is a man who even death can't stop him. I mean, this is God and we're on his side. Is now the time when we are going to rise to power? So, so it's easy for us sometimes to look back and be judgmental of these people and some of the things that they missed and some of the misunderstandings they had. But I think if we put ourselves in their shoes, um, we'd be a little bit more graceful to them. So we, we move on in verse 7. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father is set by his own authority. In other words, Jesus says, even I in my humanity, I don't know the time um, that, that God has set up for all this. So, um, you know, Jesus is incredibly patient, incredibly patient with these people. And, and, um, and, and again, I just want us to understand this is, these are real stories of, of real flawed people other than Jesus. So um, the mercy, the grace, the patience that Jesus shows that God has for his people is just amazing. So we move on in verse 8. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this is really the thesis statement of the book of Acts, that you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the seal, the promised um, seal that, that God was bringing on to those people who had believed and, and followed Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the book of Acts really, if we boil it all down to, is, is the calling of, of individuals, the calling of the collective group of people um, who believe in Jesus Christ, that we are to be his witnesses. The people back then were to, to bring the message, the good news that we read about in 1 Corinthians 15 just a few moments ago, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and the fulfillment of these covenants. That is the message that we are to give out to the world. So really, um, the church has a job to do. And see, there's an era to come. And again, these, these covenants are not completely fulfilled even as yet. There is another time coming where, where Jesus will come back. But in the meantime, in this church age, in the age that we are in, the age that we are reading about, 2,000 years ago it began um, as Jesus ascended to the Father and sent the Holy Spirit to to indwell the people, to empower them. 
um, that they were through that power of the Spirit, that they were going to all the world, starting with Judea and Samaria. Remember the, the kingdoms of Israel, the north and the south, and then to the ends of the earth, to Rome and the, and the surrounding things. Remember we talked about last week the, the, how God scattered the people after they started to come back, and, and um, they were scattered around the known world, around the Mediterranean area, Asia Minor, and, and they started to develop synagogues and and they would teach about the one true God. And there started to be people whose hearts were being prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ and started to believe the message. And they were God-fearers, right? And so, so um, just again, amazing providence on God and, and how he works on this. But we are to be witnesses um, to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the job of the church in the age that we're in, to the ends of the earth. And remember, we've seen how God perfectly worked this out into his plan. So we move on in verse 9. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So in other words, Jesus had, had been crucified. He had risen from the grave. He had spent 40 days intermittently with his, his followers. And now he ascends back to the Father. And, and yet he says, I want you to wait. I want you to stay in Jerusalem until the, the promised Holy Spirit, the one that he had talked about, Jesus had said it would be to the church's benefit, to his followers' benefit, that he would leave the scene and send um, his spirit that can indwell people and, and start this kingdom um, in, in the hearts of people all over the world. So they're kind of looking at this um, almost like a balloon fading away. It's kind of funny almost the way the writer says it. Can you imagine, I mean, just the emotions, just the awe, the mouths wide open as Jesus kind of fades into the clouds. Verse 10 says, They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. So in other words, Jesus is coming back. The same way that he left, as he took off into the sky, he will come back. And, and, and that will be a glorious day. For those who have believed in Jesus Christ and taken him as their, as their Savior and Lord, it's going to be a horrible day, um, a day of judgment. And, and just, just don't even want to think about it for those who have rejected Jesus Christ. So that is the charge of the church. We want as, as many people as we can to be ready for the return of our King, to understand and to accept the grace and the, the offer that, that this new covenant, the covenant of Jesus' blood that the prophets foretold, that, that, that we see in the Gospels, that that we celebrate as we take communion. So we have a charge, and we have work to do, and that's what the church is to be about. We are to be God's ambassadors and representatives to, to reconcile the world back to our king. So, so as Acts is about all the king's men. And, and I just want to, for the remaining time, um, just go through quickly three, three chapters in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 15, and Acts chapter 17. And as we go through these, I, I, really want you to, I really want you to read them on your own and, and read the whole book of Acts. But, but um, really what we want to kind of understand as we go through these, we, we want to kind of summarize the passage, obviously. Um, but we, we want to think about some of the Old Testament connections, passages, references that might be used, and then also the connections to the whole, the whole master narrative that we've, we've read about in the Old Testament and how it all fits together. So these are three, I think, key chapters to understand the history of the church and, and really where we're at in this ongoing story and this new covenant now that is taking place. So we want to start off with Acts chapter 2. So again, bear with me. It's going to be a lot of reading. I'll make some commentary. We're going to run through it really quickly. But hopefully you see how this is, is unfolding and working together. Acts chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost came. So again, this would have been an Old Testament festival that we could have read about that God decides to use uh, and, and take over as, as the Holy Spirit is given. So it says... When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They were waiting in Jerusalem following the instructions of Jesus before he ascended back to the Father. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as, tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, remember, every nation under heaven, what is the promise that God made to Abraham? A worldwide blessing. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. 
utterly amazed. And, and again, if we remember the, the Tower of Babel, at that point, there was one language, and then God separated the people because it was all about them making a name for themselves. Now we kind of see the reversal of this as God is bringing people together in unity and, and making um, one family, one, one group of people, one nation who are in the kingdom of God. It says, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? So God does a miracle. They're able to understand Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? God is doing something here. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11 and, and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember if we went back, Joel would have been one of, the, one of the, the prophets, the minor prophets. Verse 17, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he referenced an Old Testament passage that spoke of the specific miracle that was taking place among them, where people and filled with the Holy Spirit began to speak in tongues, languages that they didn't even know so that all people could begin to hear the message, the good news of Jesus Christ, where his new covenant, the covenant of his blood. Verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, now he's going all the way back to King David. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, he says, as he's quoted from this Old Testament passage, says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. In other words, King David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. They could go and visit the place where, where King David's bones lay. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Where have we read that? 2 Samuel chapter 7, the covenant that God made with King David that that his reign would never end through one of his a seed and offspring, and, and this great king would reign forever. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Messiah, the promised one, the one that the prophets spoke about, the one that David probably didn't even know, but he was prophesying about. The one that all the scriptures, all the covenants point to. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. We saw two people this past Sunday morning get baptized in fulfillment of, of really what, what we see throughout the book of Acts. Oftentimes, the pattern is people heard the word, the message, the good news of Jesus Christ proclaimed by the apostles, and, and, it, and it would cut them to the heart. And they said, What do we do? 
And the apostles said, repent. Realize that you're a sinner toward, towards Jesus and, and as a sign of what has taken place in your heart as you've received him, be baptized to signify the death, burial, and resurrection and that you're identifying with that and you're declaring yourself to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There should be, uh, again, in the book of Acts, we see this over and over again, belief and baptism, belief and baptism. So if you're there and if you've believed in Jesus Christ but never identified with him in baptism, I think you should read through the book of Acts with eyes that are open. So again, verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many others, words he warned them and he pleaded to them save yourselves from this corrupt generation and those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day in other words people heard the good news of Jesus Christ they believed it they repented of their sins they turned away from doing life their own way to God and then they were baptized and then as we know Jesus gave a charge they continued to learn and the church began to grow and then they became representatives, ambassadors, witnesses for Jesus and told them what Jesus had done for them and how he had been raised from the dead. That's the work of the church. Verse 42, we see this. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They got together to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They, they remembered the, the message of Jesus Christ through communion. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles God, in this instance, to, to back up the message, allowed these apostles to do some amazing things that we read about throughout the book of Acts. It says, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in other words, this, this chapter 2 is, is huge. Um, it, it's huge. There's, we see that, that, that it's spreading you know, first to the Jews, but then to the Gentiles. And, and, and I think this reflects the Abrahamic covenant, that God would, would, would rise up a people that he would give them, a, and we're seeing the people now through the, the, the descendants of Abraham, and, and we're going to read about, I, I think, more next week in, in, in referencing it now, but, but all those who by faith believe in Jesus are actually the seed of Abraham. So we are, we are God's people. We are part of the fulfillment of these, of these promises, these covenants that God had made. Um, and, and so a people, a land, and not only do we have a land, we, we have the, a, a kingdom, the kingdom of God, and one day we will inherit the earth, the scriptures say. Right? And, the, and, the, and that Abraham and his people were to be a worldwide blessing, and we're starting to see that now as the message is not just for the Jews any longer, but it's for the whole entire world. And, and the sign of this new era, this new covenant, is the Holy Spirit. And the, the, we didn't talk much about it, but in the, the Abrahamic covenant, the, the sign was circumcision. And I'm glad that, that, that that's not, not, not what we have here. Now the sign, the seal, um, what we see is, is, is binding in, in, in this new covenant is, is the Holy Spirit, where people are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment of God, what God talked about in the Old Testament. This Old Testament narrative is beginning to be connected together as the promises takes on this new light. So um, we see all kinds of different things in, in, in the book of Acts. And I want to move on to Acts chapter 15. Because again, as we've seen in this story, God made promises to Abraham. He made promises to, to David. He made promises to the nation of Israel. He had a specific group of people that was to present, you know, um, who he was to the world. Um, with the idea that eventually they would be a worldwide blessing and that, that through Jesus Christ, all could come to the Father. But, but this movement, this, this church that was being born was, was first of all Jewish. Um, as we just read, people are still meeting together in, in synagogues and in the temple. So this is kind of a sect uh, of Judaism that, that's starting to emerge. And we move on to, to Acts chapter 15. And again, just follow along with me, a lot of reading. But it says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, um, they were saying, hey, you need to become really a Jew 
in order to follow Jesus Christ. It says, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. The news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. So again, God used this apostle, um, Paul, who... If we read his story, which we get in the book of Acts, and, and who was, it was really a, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew of Jews, um, God kind of knocked him off his high horse. And, and it's funny, this, this man, Paul, who was Saul, who had tried to snuff out the church, um, was now the one that was leading the church into all the world. We move on in verse 5. It says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up. So again, these are believers in Jesus Christ, but they're still Pharisees, they're Jews. Um, religious Jews and, and leaders. It says the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Okay. The apostles and elders met to, to dis consider this question, and after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? In other words, now he's going back to the Mosaic Covenant that we've talked about, right? Where the people said, hey, we will follow the law. And, and we've seen from the story that that was not possible. And, and, and obviously, you know, there's, there's, we, we, are, we are to obey, but... But it is a burden that, that is just not possible. We're sinners. We see that all the way from Genesis 3. And problem is sin. And, and fortunately, God, through, through Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, did something about that. But Peter reminds him, hey, this was a burden that was too, too big for us. We couldn't keep it. Why are we putting this on the shoulders of these new believers? Verse 10 says, Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So this new covenant is the blood of Jesus Christ, our faith and trust in him, and he will cover over our sins and forgive us and we can be reconciled to God. Verse 12, it says, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. James would have been the brother of Jesus Christ. It says, brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and, and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. Again, a reference to the Old Testament scriptures and the King David and in the history that we've read about and talked about. Verse 19, he continues on. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. And with them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization to disturb you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Saul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain, food from you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. And, and, and I'm going to stop there. But here's a key. We see in chapter 2 that really the, the sign, the, 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 the initiation, the inauguration of this, this new covenant, this new era, was the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to, to Jews who believed in Jesus Christ in a powerful way, as we've seen. But also, it began to be given to all Gentiles who, who believed in Jesus Christ. And, and this was a, a, a new deal. And they had to decide, you know, really what, what we're reading here, as we've seen the Holy Spirit is, is key, is, is do people who come to Jesus Christ have to first become Jewish? Because it was, it was that where it grew out of, right? Where Christianity came from and grew out of Jesus was Jewish. He was writing into a Jewish culture, living in a Jewish culture. And we see that, that it, this was a hard concept for many of the people who, even though they believed in Jesus Christ, they were, they were practicing Jews. And, and they had always understood that the covenant was, was for them and, and through them, but maybe they had missed that it was through them to the entire world and forgotten some of that. And this is addressed in this key chapter in Acts chapter 15, that now... The message of Jesus, the good news, the covenant promises are available not just to the people of, of, of Abrahamic descent, but to the people who believed, who had faith like Abraham did. We're all seeds, and it's now open to the whole world, and these promises of a worldwide blessing is taking place. So we're going to move on to, to Acts chapter 17, and I want to skip forward and start with verse 16 as we kind of close down tonight. With verse 16, it says, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. Remember that we talked about that last week. Some people who probably through the influence of the Jewish people as they'd been scattered had come to believe in, in this one true God, even though they didn't fully understand things. So he, reasoned, um, so he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So Jesus, I mean, Paul is in Athens and he's testifying, he's doing what we are supposed to do. Um, testifying to the good news of Jesus Christ and mentioning how, how Jesus had, had been crucified and risen from the grave, his resurrection. It says, Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Because all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So they were just... Uh, it was just a, a, a time where people would, would talk about these different ideas. They were open to different ideas. They would debate um, a, a, an intellectual kind of time period, but a foolish time period at the same time. And Paul speaks into this. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. So he's among them. And, and remember, we, we know Greek and Roman you know, mythology and their, their idolatry and, and the gods and goddesses that they worshipped. And, and we even talked about, I, I, you know, I, I think some of that last week with Artemis, or maybe I'm still getting into that. But, um, but, uh, but we're, we see how these you know, just different um, philosophies and religions are there, and Paul speaks into that. It says again, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So in other words, he starts right with where they're at. They have all these idols, all these statues to, to God and to cover themselves. And again, I, I mentioned it last week, this, this Greek and Roman religious system was just kind of stupid by this time. And I think it was perfect for the setting for Jesus to come onto the scene. But he says, you've even got a statue dedicated to the unknown God. He goes, that's the one. You worship a God that you don't even know what he stands for. I'm gonna speak to you about him because he is the one true God. He starts with where they're at. And then it says, he goes on. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul, amazingly, now starts to tell the good news 
of Jesus Christ. And he goes all the way back to Genesis 1, that there's one creator and he made all men from one man, Adam, right? And yet the people don't even know that he's really quoting from his Old Testament scriptures, from the scriptures that he knew. As a matter of fact, Paul even quotes from some of their own poets of the day. I think we could learn a lot from this. He doesn't come in and tell them how wrong they are. He tries to find some common ground and use that to speak about the good news of Jesus Christ. He doesn't insult them. He doesn't tell them how foolish they are. He, 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 he focuses on the story of Jesus. He, he, he teaches the covenants and, and the promises from the Bible and yet doesn't even mention the Bible. And we see that's different because earlier we saw how I, I believe it was Peter preached and, and he quoted the Old Testament, because he was speaking to many Jews who were familiar with that. Now we're speaking to Gentiles, to Greeks, who have no idea what the Old Testament scriptures say. And we find common ground. So we need to be wise. Scriptures say we need to be shrewd as serpents, but innocent as doves as we speak to people and fulfill our commission, which we see in this new covenant era, this new, this new time frame, this new era is to be ambassadors, to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Verse 29, Paul goes on, therefore, since we are God's offspring, and this is, this is different than anything that they'd heard about their other gods who, who were evil and fought and, you know, and didn't create out of love and, and did not create mankind in the image of God. It says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. He says, our, our God's so above that. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. He says there is a time that is coming and, and God's overlooked some of these things, but, but the day when Jesus will return and, and there will be judgment, he says the time is short and you need to repent and you need to turn towards Jesus before he comes back or before you die because there is a reckoning. In a judgment, and there is only one true God, and he rose from the grave. Verse 32, when they heard this, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, just like today. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that point, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So in other words, we see in this story how, the, how, it, how it starts to spread. The good news of Jesus is proclaimed and, and we have to do it in a wise way. I, I believe that we're living in a time now where, where many people are not familiar with the story, maybe in the United States in a way that they've never been before. So we need to think about how we witness about Jesus Christ and to be wise and to find some common ground and, and to be true, but also to be full of grace and to be kind as, as, we, as we proclaim boldly and unapologetically, the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's amazing how Paul's in this idolatrous you know, situation and, and he confronts this in, in a way that, that just elevates the good news of Jesus Christ. So we've seen how, how really the new era is ushered in by the giving of the Holy Spirit and now God resides with his people and in, in, within his kingdom in the hearts of people. We read about that earlier in Ezekiel and in, in earlier weeks and this this hidden kind of veiled reference to, to the new covenant is now onto the scene and the sign of that is the Holy Spirit. Then we saw how, how it, was, it was beginning to, not just for the Jewish people in Acts chapter 15, but now for the whole world. And then again, I wanted to summarize it by chapter 17 that's showing and, and confirming what we read about back in Acts chapter one and in Acts chapter two, how our job as the king's men, who the king now is, Temporarily gone, although he's here in the presence of the Holy Spirit and in a powerful way where we can all be filled and, and strengthened and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do amazing things. Jesus said that his church would do greater things than even he did. And I think he was referencing that we are to reach the whole world, which we are, and we need to continue to do that because while the king has left the scene, he is coming back. And in the meantime, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses, to spread the good news, to teach people about the love of our God, about the problem with sin, about how he is the only one that can deal with that, and he has through his son Jesus Christ who sacrificed himself and rose from the grave, and, and he offers amazing grace to us. So, so the challenge for all of us who have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who are empowered by the Holy Spirit, is to be his witnesses 
to the end of the age, to the end of the earth until Jesus returns. And then we will see here in a couple weeks um, how that is fulfilled in just a, an amazing and glorious way. So next week, we're going to continue on um, to, the, to the letters, to the 21 uh, letters, and we're going to see how, how, how the church continued to grow, um, how there were some difficulties that they had to face, um, as, and we read about some of that today, um, you know, what, what things are to be put on to the believers as they come to, to Jesus, and basically what they're saying is, is we want to make it easy for people to come to accept Jesus Christ, but we we're going to see how they confronted some false teaching, what the church is to believe, and then how the church is, is to go out and to act and, and to live out our faith amongst the world. So uh, continue to stay with us. Hopefully this is making sense as we build upon it. Two more weeks of this, and then, um, and then I, I think that hopefully we've all just been enriched and blessed by the amazing story of Scripture. So I want to pray for us. Father in heaven, just thank you for... Uh, for your history, for, from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And Father, um, I pray that we just dive into this book and, and you promise that you will reveal yourself to us more and more. Um, help us to do it with humble hearts, with broken and contrite spirit, realizing that, that we are messed up and that, that only we can be made new through, your, through the gift of your Holy Spirit, through, through your presence in our lives. We thank you that you're faithful to your word. We thank you that you fulfill your promises in, in amazing, awesome ways that we couldn't even understand. And Father, I pray that all of us um, take seriously the, the charge that Jesus gave, the charge that is reiterated and restated and, and shown in the, in the book of Acts that we are to be your witnesses to the end of the earth until the end of the age, until Jesus returns. So Father, bless our efforts. Help us to repent of our sin and to turn towards you and to, to, to obey because you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great evening.